<laughs> um, so for our purposes, that was, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so I think that um, it's our, our time is up, unfortunately, um, but we will be, um, we'll, yeah. So I just want to thank our panelists um, on behalf of everyone. Um, we're really grateful that you shared your time and knowledge with us. Um, and uh, we will be uh, resuming at 1.15 or sorry, 1 Eastern time. So in about um, 12 minutes with our third panel on pre-cinematic intermedial copyright. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You very much. Thank you all. So I think we're ready to, for our third panel to begin. I'll turn things over to Artemis Willis, who's gonna be host chairing this panel. Yoke. Um, hello and welcome to the third and final panel of the day. I'm Artemis Willis and I'll be chairing uh, this session. Um, and we have a rather large panel, so I'm without any further ado, I'm just going to give brief introductions um, and we'll, we'll get going. So our first uh, panelist is Frank Ming, who is a graduate student in the Film and Media Studies program at Columbia University and he focuses on early cinema and media archeology span under the tutelage of fellow domatorians and professors, Jane Gaines and Vito Adriasens. Um, and his paper is entitled, uh, The Case of My Bridge, A Photographer's Problem in Motion. Thank you so much. So yeah, as mentioned, the title is The Case of My Bridge, A Photographer's Problem in Motion. So, so everyone knows that Edward Moy Bridge, the multifaceted Anglo-American photographer, successfully captured the legible sequential images of galloping horses on once California governor Leland Stanford's race horse ranch on June the 19th, 1878. Less well known is that nearly four years after the pornophotographic event, Moy Bridge sued his one-time patron for copyright infringement demanding an injunction against a recent publication, The Horse in Motion, with $50,000 in damages. Authored by Dr. Jacob Steelman under the auspices of Stanford, The Horse in Motion featured five photographs and 91 lithographs from the motion studies, but omitted the photographer's name from the book's title page. In fact, uh, the name Moybridge appeared only once in the preface written by Stanford simply referred to as a very skillful photographer hired to execute a series of experiments designed by his sponsor. So this lawsuit raised open-ended questions about the proprietorship of the Palo Alto, Palo Alto Motion Studies, puzzling historians for more than a hundred years. Biographers either denounced Stanford's planned betrayal portraying the railroad tycoon as a grand thief stealing credit from people deserving it, or condemn Moybridge's injured vanity, framing the photographer's subsequent financial difficulty as a ritually deserved punishment. The recent decade has witnessed shifting scholarly attention from the ownership of the motion studies to authorship in motion photographs. Demetrio Latzis, Martha Brown, Alexander Allison, and Alan Daigle question Moybridge's relationship to his photographic works from various angles and enrich our understanding of photographic authorship as a fledgling medium. So I will argue that these two strands of inquiries should not be separated. In fact, a substantial part of the ownership problem stemmed from contesting authorship in photography in the United States between the median's copyright inclusion in 1865 and judicial recognition in 1884. With every new medium comes with a long lasting debate surrounding the overarching idea that in Francois Alhera and Maria Todahada's words, crystallizes a specific definition of a dispositive based on its quality or function. Not surprisingly, a central question in the dispute between Moybridge and Stanford was who owned the idea of motion photography. Far from a unitary conception with definite reference, 
the idea here actually consists of three sub ideas constantly in competition with one another. For Stanford, the most pivotal idea was for the idea of animal local uh, animal progression or animal locomotion. Acknowledging that Moiberg took the pictures, Stanford insisted that he had for a long time been interested in debunking the canonical theory of animal locomotion, which he thought had many errors. He thus solicited and employed Moiberg to experiment. Besides a whole list of electricians, mechanics, and other assistants. Uh, Stanford repeated this position several times elsewhere, most notably in a letter to Steelman on January the 5th, 1883, where he claimed that, quote, the factual facts are from beginning to the end, he was an instrument to carry out my ideas. Moybert did not dismiss Stanford's idea but simply found it unoriginal. According to Moybert, everything conceptually contributed by, uh, contrib contributed by Stanford was like those accepted for a long time before. Moybert accentuated instead the idea of instantaneous photography by underlying his expenditure of time, labor, study, and skill in photographic art, expertise peculiar to himself. In doing so, Moybert reversed Stanford's narrative. It was only after a consultation with him that Stanford became interested in the subject matter and was offered a practical plan to disclose the previous idea. So the issue we have here is that none of these two ideas fell under the category of the US copyright law, as it only protects a work uh, as it only protects a work's creative expressions, not the underlying substance. While Stanford's idea was exceedingly abstract, Moybridge's was overly specific. Both had to resort to the third idea, which is the use of photography as the instrument to render the copyright case legitimate. Bringing the third idea into consideration, the divergence between Stanford and Moybridge unwittingly reflected two contrasting views on the originality of chronophotography. The threshold question can thus be reframed as, should chronophotography be recognized as a process or a product? Two contradictory doctrines outline the status of photography in the 19th century. Photography as evidence slash science and photography as art. Concerning American copyright law, the tension between straight and artistic photography climax in Burroughs versus Saroni, 1884, just one year before Moybridge versus Stanford was settled. In this Lamar case, a celebrity portrait of Oscar Wilde by Napoleon Saroni forced the court to decide whether photography was a legitimate writing by a human author and fell under the protection of copyright law. While the, lower uh, while the lower court found that photographic production does not present the essential characteristic of works of art, the Supreme Court separated artistic photographs from ordinary ones and attributed their originality mainly to posing, composition, and arrangement. Ostensibly, the dispute between Stanford and Moybridge mirrored what happened between Burroughs and Saroni. Like Burroughs' disposal of automatism, which suggests that photography requires no intellectual and original labor and acts solely as the guarantor of unchangeable laws of nature, Stanford recognized the potential of chronophotography in this unmediated translation of preconceived scientific knowledge. As John Ott notes, central to Stanford's mind was a Palo Alto system in which not only the horses were treated as gears, levers, and engines, but the human perception was also circumvented by machine visions. Stanford's insistence on having a medical doctor rather than Moybridge to author the book echo his view of chronophotography as the product of a rational positivist science. While sharing some of Stanford's pseudoscientific enthusiasm, 
Moibert embraced artistic discourses by calling attention to the creative processes like execution, exposition, and demonstration, which were manifested in, the, in Moibert's refinement of the techniques of instantaneous photography and preparation of photographs and negatives. Motion photography, Moibert insisted, is an art form requiring, quote, not only the boldness of the conception, but also assiduous and skillful efforts. Uh, however, this dichotomy between science and art is problematic in Moorbridge's case due to the authorless nature of the chronophotographic practice. While the Supreme Court dispensed half of Bruegel's brief on locating an author despite the imputable presence of a human intervener, which is Saroni, it was overwhelmingly startling that the originality of the motion photographs was never in question, even though all the camera shutters were triggered automatically. In the Horse in Motion, a set of six cabinet cards published in 1878, Moybridge posted a copyright notice by providing the words illustrated by Moybridge under each cabinet card, while at the same time flaunting it as an automatic electro photograph. By inscribing creative authorship into a standardizing mechanism, the motion studies simultaneously claim originality while reaffirming automatism. Corresponding with this entanglement of creativity and invention, was the hybridization of intellectual property law. Copyright and patent are almost, always, uh, uh, are almost always understood as two bifurcated domains having unique legal functions. Nevertheless, a growing number of legal scholars have pinpointed the interrelationships between creative output and technological innovation, especially during time of major social change, like the two turns of the century. This legal borderland was no stranger to Moybridge. In fact, one of the most broadly circulated explanations for the court's decision in the absence of an official opinion is the shutter theory. According to Terry Ramsey, Moybridge lost the case because his patented electromagnetic shutters were found to be invented by someone else, most likely John D. Isaacs a young engineer of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Assuming Ramsey was correct, uh, the court eventually pinned down the second idea, that is the techniques of instantaneous photography as the basis for determining the authorship in the disputed chronal photographs. This should have been in Moybridge's favor. However, in order to locate authorial intervention in an otherwise self-regulating practice, the court went further to single out the key invention responsible for the production of the motion photographs. Of all the possible candidates, the shutter, the very apparatus making possible an exposure time of milliseconds was chosen as the legal essence of the motion picture. Hence, this copyright case was solved by an invalid patent claim. Interestingly, in Burroughs versus Saroni, the Supreme Court located photography's authorship in the pre-shutter activities. Justice Miller decreed for Saroni not by examining the expressive properties of the wild portrait, but through two paragraphs of description of posing, selection, and arrangement taken verbatim from Saroni's complaint. As copyright scholar Christian Farley suggests, the court could have pinpointed authorship in the work done by the camera person, such as the timing to click the shutter, the angle of the shot, the frame, and the focus. It did not act like that, probably because Saroni was not the cameraman in the technical sense, just like Moybridge. Saroni outsourced all the mechanical work to an employee, Benjamin Richardson, who operated the shutter. So the shutter acting as the ultimate arbiter in one case was excluded entirely in another. 
Nevertheless, together, these two cases were testimony to a photography author separable from the literary sense of authoring, a detachment of the manufacturing process from its end product, and a disengagement of originality from the technical originator. Such division of labor and the managerial hierarchy would become a standard with the emergence of cinema. 20 years later, Thomas Edison clashed with Sigmund Lubin over a quotidian cinematographic record of a launching a boat. In Farley's words, the court did not even bother to examine if Edison, quote, who either took the pictures or seemed to have directed the taking of the pictures was the proper author. It was not until the 1909 Copyright Act that work made for hire was codified. And three more years later, the motion picture was legally recognized. However, when an authorship dispute arose between someone managing the budget and someone dictating the, the performance, yet now manipulated the camera, it is probably justifiable to argue that the film director and producer were already born in the 1880s. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Frank, thank you so much. Um, and our next speaker is Michael Cowan. Hello, Michael. Um, he's a film and media historian as well as a Germanist and he's also professor uh, and department chair of Cinematic Arts at the University of Iowa and a member of the Dormitor Executive Committee. Um, his talk, as you can see, is entitled Marais, Pettigrew and the Wings of the Inspect. Thank you, Artemis, and thanks everyone. It's really exciting to be on this panel with so many fantastic scholars. I will jump right in for reasons of time. Um, the question of appropriation in early cinema often brings to mind cases surrounding the pioneers of entertainment film, for instance, the many imitations of Melius. But early cinema, as we know, also took up other cultural series, and analogous questions might have played out differently depending on context. There we go. Um, what, for example, were the expectations around the borrowing of scientific footage, for instance, when Mornal spliced images from the Ufa Kultur film, The Soul of the Plant, into Nosferatu? Did scientific filmmakers borrow from each other with or without out attribution? Were there disputes of ownership surrounding signature techniques such as time-lapse cinephotography? And what pressures existed around scientific parodies such as this Hepworth film discussed by Oliver Geiken, which spoofs Charles, Charles Urban's popular Unseen World series of 1903? Any effort to answer these questions would need to look backwards and ask more broadly, how did disputes over ownership play out in the visual culture of science? In that context, the most frequent form of dispute was less about intellectual property than intellectual priority. In his classic study of the phenomenon, sociologist Robert Merton showed that quarrels over the priority of discovery, which riddled the history of science, became the dominant form of ownership dispute for multiple reasons. One is the tendency of scientists to work on similar problems at the same time. Indeed, almost every famous dispute of this type involves discoveries made more or less in parallel. Another factor is the structural pressure on individual scientists to demonstrate innovation in fields predicated on the creation of new knowledge. But that pressure is counterbalanced by a third factor, namely the understanding of scientific knowledge as a public good, something to be shared rather than owned or hoarded. Indeed, precisely because science is understood as a disinterested pursuit, disputes over ownership overwhelmingly take this one char characteristic form, namely as disputes over the recognition for the discovery of new knowledge. In this paper, I ask how one such dispute involving Etienne Jules Marais not only exemplifies Merton's pattern, but also tells us something about the different potentials and legacies of 19th century motion study. The rift broke out in April 1870 when the French Academy of Sciences received a complaint from the Scottish animal locomotion expert, James Bell Pettigrew, who claimed that Marais had failed to credit him, Pettigrew, as the first to observe that the insect wings, that insect wings form a figure eight pattern when flying. Marais had published two short reports detailing his own observations of insect wings in the, in the Academy Journal a year earlier. But Pettigrew argued that his observations preceded Marais by several months. In response to the claim in the complaint, Marais did acknowledge Pettigrew's priority in the observation of the figure eight, 
although he insisted that the two interpreted the discovery differently. Now, this debate might have ended there, but Pettigrew continued to highlight Mari's derivativeness at every opportunity. And Mari himself went on in publications such as La, La Machine Animale from 1874 to elaborate the ways in which Pettigrew had misunderstood his own observations. Indeed, the quarrel was serious enough to merit yet another publication in 1875 by one Professor Coftry titled Aerial Locomotion, Mar Pettigrew versus Mare, in which Coftry systematically defends the reputation of his fellow British scientist. Coftry's treatise, sorry, Coftry's treatise includes moments resembling copyright claims, especially when he accuses Mare of reproducing a key image visualizing figure eight movement from Pettigrew without attribution. But this was only a side note to Coptry's real argument, which focused on the priority of discovery and who had interpreted the figure correctly. The debate about insect wings had direct relevance for aviation research, to which both Mari and Pettigrew sought to contribute. Pettigrew, who wrote extensively on flying machines, is still re remembered at the University of St. Andrews as the eccentric professor who built an ornithopter at the age of 70 and broke his leg in his one and only short flight down Abbey Street. Marais' central critique of Pettigrew also resonates in this context, since he claimed that Pettigrew had mistakenly attributed the figure eight pattern to complex muscle movements, whereas he, Marais, understood that it resulted from the interaction between the shape of the wings and air pressure. Like most such disputes, the rift over insect wings resulted partly from the fact that the researchers were undertaking analogous efforts simultaneously to observe and reproduce motions normally inaccessible to human perception. This is no surprise since they were working amidst a much broader revolution in motion study, which also informed the well-known philosophies of motion, such as those of Henri Bergson in France and Constantin Brunner in Germany. For instance, Pettigrew's first major book publication from 1874, Animal Locomotion or Walking, Swimming and Flying, began with a basic precept, quote, all matter, whether living or dead, whether solid, liquid or gaseous, is constantly changing forms, in other words, constantly moving. Similarly, Marais' La Machine Animale, which came out the previous year, included the line, quote, motion is the most apparent characteristic of life. It acts on solids, liquids, and gases. Against this backdrop, scientific observation was also changing, as we know, by adopting optical media, which could help to observe and record movement in ways that the unaided eye could not. Marais' many photographic innovations are, of course, exemplary of that process. And if we follow Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, this mediatization of scientific vision also coincided with the transformation in the standards of objectivity. Observation, so the story goes, was moving away from the effort to capture ideal types of natural phenomena informed by the artist illustrator's intuition and towards more machinic protocols, which called on scientists to suppress, suppress their subjectivity. Though Dastin Gallison never claimed that photography caused this shift, it clearly exemplified it, not least of all through its ability to capture phenomena invisible to the eye. That process is, of course, most famously, as we just heard again, um, associated with Mui Bridge's demonstration of the horse's gallop. But it also underlay these debates around the movement of insect wings. Within this context, it's tempting to associate Mari and Pettigrew as the winners and losers in this story of changing standards. While Marais, as we know, is one of the most productive pioneers of mechanically mediated observation, Pettigrew, for his part, invented very little and mostly relied on the work of others. Hence, one can easily attribute Pettigrew's insistence on his intellectual priority to the frustration of a scientist falling behind in the emerging professional world of new media that Mare represented. Pettigrew's original notes on insect wings from 1870 already emphasized how he used his own apparatuses for verifying and recording. Uh, sorry, Mare's original notes, I'm sorry, that's important. Mare's original notes on insect wings from 1870 already emphasized how he used his own apparatuses for verifying and recording the figure eight movement including smoke covered cylinders, but also processes of adorning insect wings with gold leaf to make the outline of their movement visible in the sun, a vision captured by Mare's painter colleague, Edmund Dalton in a much discussed watercolor. And yet this is hardly the entire story. It would be a mistake to imagine that Pettigrew's observations relied merely on the unaided, unaided eye. As Coftry pointed out, Pettigrew mobilized all sorts of methods to enhance natural vision. For example, by using specially prepared bell jars with one side rendered opaque and the other turned towards the light, which was in effect a similar method to Mare's gold tipped wings. Not to mention the extensive use of artificial wings to imitate animal flight under more controlled conditions. And Pettigrew would go on to champion Moybridge's instantaneous photography for its ability, in Pettigrew's own words, 
to quote, reveal, the mo reveal movements which the unaided eye cannot see. Still, there were key differences between Pettigrew and Marais, which come to the fore when we consider their work in relation to a pervasive topos and discussions around mediated observation, namely that of uncovering the secrets of nature. This too would fundamentally influence film culture, for instance, in the aforementioned Unseen World series. Both Pettigrew and Marais' work modeled this idea of revealing secret worlds of motion, but their different approaches, and specifically their use of photographic images, exemplify two different models of knowledge within this broader cultural topos. For Pettigrew, the discovery of the figure eight was meant to reveal universal patterns of natural movement. Hence, in his initial complaint to the French Academy of the Sciences, he explained that he was the first to discover, quote, that quadrupeds walk and fishes swim and insects and bats and birds fly by figure of eight movements. And he would go on to expound that universalist argument in his major books especially his great opus, Design in Nature, published in three volumes in 1908, where he discussed uni universal forms of natural growth and movement over thousands of pages, particularly the figure eight and the spiral. As the title suggests, a central objective of that book was to convince reader readers that there is design in nature. Not unlike uh, later proponents of intelligent design, Pettigrew was staunchly anti-Darwinist, writing in his preface, that, that you, the universal patterns of motion in nature, quote, can only be explained by the existence of an intelligent creator, designer, and upholder, end quote. Marais, on the other hand, showed little interest in universal forms of motion, let alone the presence of a creator, and just as often placed the emphasis on difference. For example, in his initial response to Pettigrew for the Academy of Sciences, Marais argued that Pettigrew wrongly assumed that bird wings moved in the same way as insect wings, whereas the two groups actually displayed different muscle patterns and different structures of movement. These distinct approaches to observation also impacted Marais and Pettigrew's distinct uses of instantaneous photography. Whereas Marais mobilized photography as unbiased evidence for the objectivity of his claims, Pettigrew understood photography as the starting point for further interpretation, meant to reveal universal patterns of nature through the intervention of the scientist's hand. Indeed, although Pettigrew drew extensively on Moybridge in design and nature, he never once reproduced a Moybridge photograph as a photograph. Rather, he or his illustrator, Philibert Charles Bergeau, would typically trace Moybridge's photos and reduce the surface detail down to essential outlines while adding his own lines and arrows to bring out the universal motion patterns that he extrapolated from them. In almost every case, this was a figure of eight pattern, which Pettigrew identified in the gait of a horse, an ostrich, a woman walking, and so on. Little wonder then that Pettigrew's work would later inspire movements questioning the primacy of mechanical rationality. A good example can be seen in the work of surrealist artist Max Ernst, who began appropriating Pettigrew's images for his own art and illustrations around the time of his forced exile to the US during World War II. One can see this clearly in Ernst's illustration for the cover of the first issue of the magazine VVV, a short-lived surrealist magazine published in New York by Ernst and André Breton from 1942 to 44, which appropriates a page directly from Design and Nature. The editors of VVV were quite aware that they were publishing at a time when, as they put it, quote, the forces of regression and death have been unleashed upon the earth. Within this context, the letters VVV stood for both, both victory and view, with the latter term performing a synthesis reminiscent of the famous surrealist synthesis outlined in the first surrealist manifesto. As they explained in the opening editorial, the first V stood for the external view, turned towards the conscious surface of the world, the second V for an interior view, turned towards the depths of the unconscious, and the third V would then perform a, syn a synthesis of the first two. As they put it, this was a total view, which quote, translates all the reactions of the eternal upon the actual, of the psychic upon the phys physical, and takes account of the myth in process of formation beneath the veil of happenings. Here, one can understand why Pettigrew's abstract representations of universal motion might have interested an artist like Ernst. Like the surrealist synthesis that the letters VVV were meant to express, Pettigrew's figures seem to express the eternal becoming underlying the veil of the actual, the universal process of formation behind the surface appearances of the phenomenal world. In his cover, Ernst borrows a plate replete with such abstract patterns, particularly the undulating figure eights and spirals and even extends them to adorn the very letters VVV on the journal's title with spiraling plant-like structures, as if to dynamize the letters themselves into universal motion. Ernst also removes some of Pettigrew's image captions, exchanging the numbers for V signs, and in one case, replacing Pettigrew's caption, figure 10, 
with the caption figure B plus B plus B next to the drawing of, a figure, of the figure eight movement made by a fish. This uncredited appropriation of Pettigrew's illustrations represents a different kind of borrowing from that of Marais and speaks to the enduring fascination of Pettigrew's work for counter-rational movements. But it also speaks to the unpredictable legacies of mediated vision of late 19th century motion studies, whose promise to unveil the secrets of nature also enabled more occultist appropriations of scientific imagery in works like Nosferatu. Hence, what appeared at first glance as a feud over priority of discovery also reveals a tension surrounding the kinds of mechanical observation that preceded the rise of cinema. If that observation followed the new dictates of scientific objectivity, promising to compensate for the fallible subjectivity of the observer, it could just as easily promise to have access to another realm, one full of desires and dreams. Thank you. That was terrific, Michael. Uh, thank you so much. And um, so, and our next speaker, panelist, is the inimitable Valentine Robert. She's a Domator Vice President, um, as well as a Senior Lecturer of Film Studies at the University of Lausanne. Um, and her research focuses on the interplay between film painting, uh, film and painting, in connection with theater, photography, and lantern slides. Uh, she was the curator of the Tableau Vivant in early cinema, in early film and paintings program featured at Portanone. And she's also uh, contributed to the curation of uh, the cinematic aspects of um, exhibits on Gustave Doré, James Tissot, and others. Um, and her title is Early Cinema Sued by Painting. Thank you so much, Artemis. Um, thank you very much to everyone. I should say I am very disappointed not to be with you all face to face in the same place and same time zone. So it's around 8 p.m. in here. Uh, but very happy to contribute to this fantastic question of copyright in early cinema and very honored to um, join this fantastic panel and to imagine you giving me attention behind your screen all around the globe. So. Um, I'd like to show you here that painting has put early cinema in the dock. And that although not so common and mostly forgotten today, these trials opposing painters to early filmmakers has contributed to the very definition of the cinematic image. But the major intermediate copyright battles that have been unearthed so far by early cinema historians concern literary and theatrical adaptations not pictorial ones. But as I had the opportunity to demonstrate on many occasions, such as other Domitor conference, my Pordenone film program, Tableau Vivant, or the recent exhibition, Enfin le cinéma in Paris, or, or this <laughs> fantastic new book uh, by, Slug, by Mario Slogan and Daniel Bitterheist, um, early film did copy paintings, often with an outstanding accuracy. And this accuracy has taken filmmakers to court. But let me contextualize the legal issue of these pictorial reenactments, often called tableau vivant, living pictures, or following Martin Meisel, realizations that we can define as the faithful reproduction of pre existing paintings by living actors in a pose which can be fleeting or long lasting. The early cinema was not the only setting for these performances. On the contrary, at the end of the 19th century, living pictures were performed everywhere, at the musical, the theater, the opera, the fair, in social salon, private parties, charity events, patriotic pageants, universal exhibitions, etc., etc. And surprisingly, this craze for living pictures has involved some copyright lawsuits and led to cases in which, as I put it, paintings use seeds. 1894 is not only the year of the first kinetoscopic films, it's also the year of an internationally famous trial, the so-called Living Pictures Appeal. The incriminated show was a series of living pictures presented at the Empire Theatre in London in 1894, 
the complaint was uh, filed by the German copyright owner of several paintings that were reenacted. The verdict is captivating since the performers were absolved, but the decorators were condemned. The live performance was cleared with the arguments of being, I quote, devoid of permanent character and impossible to disseminate and sold on the art market. In other words, uh, and the statement is, is fascinating, that living pictures are no products and therefore no reproduction which means producing again. The last argument is hilarious, uh, saying the tableau were composed of human performers that were impossible to confiscate. On the contrary, the two-dimensional set, concretely painted and reusable, even if totally incomplete, was seized and condemned as a counterfeit of the paintings, as well as the drawings that you are seeing here. Indeed, the essential part of the famous living picture appeal concerned these sketches published in the Daily Graphic. The plaintiff claimed that these sketches were an illegal reproduction of his paintings, however indirect, and that they competed with the legal engravings. He notably argued that the draftsman has supplemented his drawings with uh, photographs of the original paintings which proved accurate, and that the sketches did not represent anything of the scenic context. The issue was debated for a long time, and if the first judgment condemned the daily graphic, the Court of Appeal finally broke it with this conclusion. The rough sketches in the daily graphic represented what was to be seen at the Empire and did not reproduce the artistic merits and beauties of the plaintiff's picture. So what a paradox. The court juridically legitimized these reproductions because, because it denied them any artistic legitimacy. It is by condemning them artistically that it saved them legally. And the first case I wish to present in which, as I put it, paintings sues cinema, will prove that the same paradox prevails for cinematic living pictures. The case was uh, rediscovered by Alain Carou in his great paper uh, published in the special issue of 1895, 1895, uh, so the, the French review, dedicated to Feuillade, at a time in which it seems that early cinema was studied only by men. Just saying, you can see the summary. The case indeed concerned Feuillade and the painter Luc Olivier Merceau author of a very specific painting of the flight into Egypt, in which the Virgin Mary and luminous child rest in the pose of the Sphinx. The painting is so successful that it gets reproduced everywhere on all media. In fact, the painter himself um, did not paint a single original, but immediately created re replicas in painting and in drawing. It's quite hilarious because I could find a letter in which uh, the painter himself explained that, I quote, uh, uh, so his picture, son tableau, lui sort par les yeux, meaning that he himself cannot stand it anymore. We have traces of scenic living pictures of it, but more importantly, I could find early films reenacting the painting, such as this Lumière production of 1898, or this Pate production of 1902 with a quiet approximative sphinx. If these living pictures were unnoticed by Luc Olivier Merson, it was not the case of this 1910 Gaumont version in the Louis Feuillade film La Nativité. It was by coincidence during a 1913 Christmas screening that the painter suddenly discovered his own composition appear alive on the screen. Far from being flattered by this reproduction, Merson seized the film and launched a trial for counterfeiting, which lasted until 1920. The result, he lost. 
The verdict dismissed the painter with the main argument that, I quote, a careful examination reveals essential differences between the two works that do not allow them to be confused and that the characters do not present the same poses or the same expressions of physiognomy so that the impression that emerges is entirely different. But this observation proves ridiculous when comparing painting and film. Not only the living picture made manifest, um, uh, not, not only is the, the living picture made manifest by concluding the film as a motionless apparition held in pose for no less than 40 seconds. It's really like a, a big, big pose, uh, a scene like motionless scene, except from the donkey. <laughs> But the visual similarities leap to the mind, as uh, Caru says. I quote, I quote Caru, the frontal, scenic, extremely readable composition of the painting perfectly matches early cinema. Not only did the, the decorator copy all the details down to the shadows on the sphinx, but Feuillard reproduced quite closely the positions of the characters and the donkey in a tight frame. Besides, the meticulous list of differences established by the court is not without humor, since it seriously criticizes the fantasy of the donkey, which, I quote, instead of grazing, holds its head up in a completely different attitude. However, the real difference that seems to have been the low in, uh, that, that seems to have been the low here is the disregard of the film image compared to the pictorial image. Just as the rough sketches in the daily graphic were deemed unworthy of any competition with the original paintings, the film is disdained by the judges as unworthy of any artistic consideration that might overshadow the painter. I quote the judgment. The ideal realized by the artist has been substituted by a banal and vulgar staging, which remains far behind his work and with which it becomes impossible to confuse it. One understands nevertheless the just susceptibility of Luc Olivier Merson, very naturally offended to see how his work is denatured and so to speak caricatured. You can see how extreme is the disdain for early cinema. I tried to find out if this was the very argument of the defense. Is it possible to think that Gaumont played in such bad faith in order to cope commercially? Can you imagine that Feuillade would, would have denigrated his living picture, his film like that, and by force denied his entire aesthetic filmmaking? Because this film is part of the Gaumont film aesthetic series which claims loud and clear the reference to, I quote, the art of the painter as a way to reach the highest point in the art of cinematography and the creation of a film that can be considered as an artist's work, which proves effectively, which proves, sorry, which proves effective considering the moving picture world praise of the film in terms of, you can see it, a Gaumont masterpiece. So how ironic that this argument should be turned against Feuillard and lead to the aesthetical condemnation of the film. It seems rather that the aesthetic undermining of the film during the trial is the work of the jury alone at the expense of Feuillard rather than to his credit and that the Gaumont's lawyers won in spite of themselves. And could it really be seen as a victory? We can see exactly the same paradoxical phenomenon of a legalization by artistic condemnation. And now that we know that the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetical ambitions of Feuillard, we can consider that he loses much more than he wins. Caru interprets these judgments as an institutional gesture, a kind of response from the artistic aristocracy to the film aesthetic manifesto and its claims um, and its claims of artistic nobility. This might even explain why it is this film and not the previous ones that engages such a reaction. Anyway, I am not so sure that Merson, more than early cinema, is the loser. 
The second and final case I want to present will prove a less paradoxical verdict and gives a little more hope for the new media. For the new media. It concerns an Italian film called La Cella Tredici, the cell 13, produced by the Itala in 1911. The film is unfortunately lost, at least based on my research, but I appeal to all dormitorians. You never know with this incredible community. There are some traces of it mainly the, in the Italian newspapers or in American ones, as the film was distributed there by the Great Northern Special Feature Film Company. Nothing in this material explicitly refers to a painting or a pictorial reenactment. But the painter, Hubert Denis Echeverry, filed a complaint against this film for counterfeiting one of his best known works, Vertige, painted in 1903. The kiss depicted in this painting was considered at the time highly risque, almost erotic, and contributed to the huge success of this painting, which was reproduced in thousands of copies in all media, including film. But this film, Transposition was done without the agreement of the painter. Echeverry discovered the film by coincidence in Paris in November 1912 and immediately had the film seized by the courts when he recognized this painting reenacted on the screen. In fact, he did not only see his work on screen, he also saw it on the wall because the film poster was a copy of his, of his painting as well and was similarly confiscated by the painter. The judgment, which I could discover, and which you see here, was thus in two parts. It separated the film, the, the film, the moving photographic picture, and l'affiche, the still painted poster. Like the hybrid living pictures appeal, judgment, uh, which separated the living performance and the still scenery. Regarding the poster, it was condemned without restraint. The painter won the case. The court sentenced the poster as a slavish copy which disfigured the plaintiff's work, betrayed his artistic conception and caused him a certain prejudice. Regarding the film, it was more complex. Actually, through quiet assiduous research, I was able to find an image. Ta-da! <laughs> this is totally exclusive. I unearthed this picture of the cell number 13 at the Museo Nazionale del Cinema with the help of the archivist Nicoletta Pacini and Mauro Genovese, whom I would like to warmly thank here. So we can see here how faithful the film was to painting. The furniture is the same, only the point of view changes, a loop-sided uh, loop high angle versus a front view. The costumes are almost the same, the poses were or will be the same, the photograph seems extracted just before, just after the kiss, which does happen in the film the descriptions. And the sets even offer the same opening in the right background, thanks to a half open curtain that reveals a ball in the adjacent room. It turns out that the court also played this kind of seven heroes game, spotting every similarity and difference between the painted and film version, exactly like they did in the Merson trial. We can even read in the judgment that this scene was in fact introduced in the film by an intertitle that announced, I quote, un instant de vertige, repeating word for word the title of the painting, Vertige, almost as an explicit reference. But against all odds, they conclude that the unlikeness was absolute and the painter lost the case. The reproduction of the framework and of the action were not considered sufficient on the pretext that what memory keeps and what is essential in an artwork is the expression and faces of the characters. So according to this court, no living reproduction could ever be a counterfeit since its very principle is to reenact and thus transform the figures. Another argument was the cinematic movement to affirm, to affirm, to affirm that the film scene was not the counterfeit of Echeverry's painting, the judgment evoked its rapidity and the unfolding of the action at the moment of the kiss, which engaged a spasm of the whole body of the woman and a change in her expression. So more than a question of dissimilarity, it seems it was the question of media divergence, which was authoritative. 
But this time, the perspective on cinema is not the same as in Merson's trial. The dissimilarity in the, in the new media version is not treated with contempt. We underline more the particular character of the new staging, especially its aesthetical use of a mirror, which makes it specific. Finally, the real contribution of this judgment lies in the speech of the defense. Here is a quote from the trial, which is not in the verdict, but which was reported in the newspapers. I quote, and you know, gentlemen, that to be a film artist, uh, as to be a photographic artist, one must not be without intelligence. It is necessary to show skill in the choice of light and location, in the maintenance and arrangement of the characters, in order to make them evolve in the framework that suits them. And the film operator, just like the photographer, is in his, ger in his ger genre, a creator. Did the film artist who conceived Vertige conceive it in the same way as Mr. Echeverry? There may be similar details in the cinematographic work, but the work of a cinematographic artist remains original. So the comparative logic of the argument reverberates beyond the alignment of the shot and the painting. It is indeed the film artist named as such who is put on the same level as the painter and their two works consider on an equal footing. So the imitation of painting, the living pictures, have thus historically led jurists to legalize an artistic consideration of filmic images. In this trial, the filmmakers were winners all the way, credited with the recognition of the original quality of the work of the film artist. And this 1914 sentence sounds like a legislation of the artistic status of film images. I hope I could demonstrate in line with André Gaudreau, whose major contribution of, whose one of his major contributions of his first book, From Plateau to Lumière, is precisely his use of legal sources, which he called proto-theoretical. So I hope I could demonstrate how crucial these legal documents and proto-theoretical documents are as a historical source for the pictures of all kinds. Because beyond the legal status, it is their artistic status that is at stake, especially invaluable for early cinema, as they can delineate the, th the threshold of the, the artistic recognition of the moving pictures. Thank you for your attention. We are. That was great, Valentine. And uh, now I have the, uh, the dubious honor of introducing myself. I'm a former member of the Domator EC. Um, I'm a media historian, media arts curator, and media maker, uh, currently in residence at MIT, where I'm working. Uh, my fellowship project is a book titled Lanternology. Um, and I'm also working on some related exhibitions. And in this uh, paper, um, it's a kind of an aspect of my lanternology project as feminist historiography or uh, feminist media archaeology. So let me see. I'm going to try to start screen sharing in a moment. Okay. My paper begins in grayscale, without a subtitle, and in media res. At the premiere of Edison's Vitascope on April 23, 1896, at Coster and Biles Music Hall, an important vaudeville theater at 134 West 34th Street in New York City. Thomas Armat, one of the inventors of the Vitascope system, is running the projector for a program of six short motion pictures, which are treated as a vaudeville act and shown just before intermission, the second best position on the bill. Most of the films themselves also feature vaudeville acts, a burlesque boxing match between tall and short comedians, for instance, albeit canned, canned vaudeville. So the event epitomizes the, quote, intermedial meshing, unquote, of kinematic practices before cinema's relative autonomy as a media medium, according to Andre Gaudreau, 
with Edison drawing on techniques derived from the established, quote, cult cultural series, unquote, of vaudeville. Um, that's God Godreau's concept of early film's difference from its institutionalized future. Uh, to make films shown at this vaudeville house. Quote, in this way, noted the New York Times, the bare canvas before the audience instantly becomes a stage upon which living beings move about, close quote. Inside the house, the world of the screen is mute and largely monochrome, much like the Russian writer Maxim Gor Gorky's Kingdom of Shadows, except that is for the hand-colored umbrella and serpentine dances that bookend the lineup and create a particular kind of visual interest. Uh, and these frames, these are a few frames from the serpentine dance as they appeared on this notice for the celebration of the 125th anniversary of the Coster and Bile program at Columbia last year. So, quote, the program began and ended, as Charles Muster has noted, with films of women that indulge male voyeuristic pleasures. Here in the United States Copyright Office, the vast majority of the earliest motion pictures submitted are dance films, like those shown at Coster and Biles. Indeed, most of the Edison Company's Kinetoscope productions of 1894 feature female dancers bearing their legs in serpentine, umbrella, butterfly, Turkish high kick, fan, belly, Japanese, and Spanish dances, subjects that aim to attract male viewers to Edison's peep show parlors. In other words, they were films of women made by and for men. And as we can see, this man is listening as well as peeping at a kinetophone, an updated kinetoscope with a phonograph placed inside the cabinet introduced in 1895 to boost the kinetoscope business. But who were the women filmed at the Black Mariah studio in West Orange, New Jersey? Some, such as the voluptuous Spanish dancer Carmen Cita, the first to appear in front of Edison's camera, were also headline attractions at Coster and Biles. And here is an unfinished portrait of Carmen Cita by John Singer Sargent uh, from 1890, and her image on the marker in front of Macy's as well. So Carmen Cita was very famous. But up to now, little else has been known about the women who danced for early film. This paper begins elsewhere in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Here we discover the somewhat startling fact that a certain Lola Uberry, a dancer who appeared in two of Edison Coe's kinetoscope moving pictures directed by Alfred Clark, the cyclone dance and the fan dance, submitted two patent applications for novel, non-obvious and useful inventions several, several years later in 1900. Um, no, uh, novel, non-obvious, and useful being the three criteria for patent submission. Um, an apparatus and a method for creating a series of scenic representations that seamlessly dissolved into one another in three-dimensional space. My invention, she wrote, comprises primarily the method of producing a scenic representation which consists in projecting by concentrated light thrown through a picture and refracting medium as by a stereopticon or magic lantern, an image of said picture upon the marginal portion of, of a centrally apertured forward located screen and simultaneously similarly projecting the image of a picture upon a continuous screen located rearwardly of said marginal screen. So let's take a look at her patent. And while there isn't enough time to go into her bio, um, she was from Mexico, not Spain, although she did perform Spanish dances and she was well known. Um, this photo, for instance, is, is taken from the Metropolitan Museum's collection and it's from a trade card uh, from the Actors and Actress series issued for Virginia, Virginia Wright's Bright's Cigarettes. Um, so figure one is showing um, a section of the, of the proscenium, the stage, the lantern and screens. And figure two is illustrating the same, carrying out further features of her invention, i.e. The, the rearward continuous screen and the back projecting lantern. And figure three is a kind of a frontal view of the centrally apertured and reflective transparent front screen as it would appear in practice of her method. And 
figures four to six are lantern slides that might be used in the method. And just incidentally, figure six is a just a color slide, um, kind of a, I've made it um, kind of indigo and violet here, but she, that's what was one of her favorite colors, but she would uh, project that kind of between the planes, um, the two screen planes and sort of suffusing the entire space with a, with, you know, making it a wash with a kind of color. So thus at London's Alhambra Theater in Leicester Square, she captivated audiences with her production, A Dream of the Dance, in which she stepped into different worlds and performed a series of weird dances within them. All great dancers of the world seem to come to the London Alhambra sooner or later. At the Alhambra, La Belle Mexicaine, as she, was, she has been named in America, appears in the floral fantasy entitled A Dream of the Dance. The article continues, the audience sees the birth of Terpsichore and then in quick succession, Lola Berry presents dances ranging from the savage to those of the 20th century. The intermediate items are the Egyptian, the Grecian, the Oriental, the Spanish, the French empire and the English. By an ingenious arrangement for patented inventions, the scene is changed to suit each dance. The accompanying pictures give only a dim idea of the whole touch of color in Iberi's curious performance. So Iberi's inventions represented a forward thinking approach to scenic design, a combination of established media, magic lanterns, glass slides, transparent and reflective screens, um, that were renewed in ensemble and realized in her creative work. As an artist technologist, she was working in wholly projected scenic representations and, and there were no shadows thrown or anything the way that she kind of, and they dissolved seamlessly between each other um, entirely. So these uh, decades before the formalized use of projection in the theater, a century before a patent filed for an image forming apparatus and method for live performances. And that was US patent number 6,341,868 B1. Um, I, uh, and, and that patent actually cites patents from the 1890s to the late 1990s, um, showing the kind of the generative dimension of um, patent, uh, um, patent, patents versus copyrights. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, and light years before digital scenery and virtual production, which we're starting to see a ton of, um, the creation of virtual worlds within real world environments. By excavating these patents and attending to the absences and anomalies and asymmetries they shed light on, I aim to open up new pathways into exploring lantern history and feminist media history that includes Ada Lovelace, English mathematician and associate of Charles Babbage, who wrote a program for his prototype of a digital computer. She's often called the world's first computer program, programmer. Quote, the analytical engine, she said, weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves, close quote. Loie Fuller, an, an inventor who held many patents for stage lighting, her innovations in lighting design, particularly her projections of color and moving images, such as mechanized uh, butterflies, onto swirling silk are light years ahead of her time and really more akin to 3D projection mapping in their precision and effects. Incidentally, Fuller was also a member of the French Astronomical Society. Hedy Lamarr, the Austrian American actress and inventor who pioneered a communication system that used frequency hopping amongst radio waves, technology that would one day form the basis of today's Wi Fi, GPS, and Bluetooth communication systems. Taken together, these media histories move us away from the restrictive legal vacuum of the Copyright Office. I liked that in our conference description legal vacuum to the generative world of the patent building. From the linear histories highlighting the achievements of sole male inventors, auteurs here represented by a peeping Edison, who did something I think rather retrograde with the new technology of motion pictures, to nonlinear and non-synchronous histories made by an ensemble of women artists, technologists, whose inventions were prograde and arguably much more interesting. And from Lola Iberi, featured dancer in two of Edison's kinetoscope films, 
to Dolores de Santa Maria de Aberi, early woman media pioneer, um, a dancer inventor who saw things in a different light. As Oliver Wendell Holmes famously wrote in his breakfast table series of essays, a mind stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimensions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know that we have any, oh, it looks like we've got some people are writing into the chat, but if anybody has any questions out there, um, please throw them into the Q&A and we will try to field them. Um, I thought I might ask everyone, um, you know, how, uh, how your research and this cluster of papers kind of um, expands, unsettles, um, rethinks kind of the terms of, um, of our panel itself of intermediality um, and pre-cinema. Um, you know, some of us who work on non-cinematic forms a lot kind of have a little, you know, grudge about that pre-cinema, but I know it's descriptive also. But anyway, I'm just curious if, if, uh, if you found in your research kind of just complications in any of those areas with perhaps your form responding to early film, for instance, or something. Maybe Valentine. Um, can can you perhaps repeat it or? Well, I I'm guess sure. in some of my research, I've found I, I've found traces by tracing, especially style, which I think is a place where kind of um, you know form and culture can and do meet. Um, I've found places where the lantern is actually responding to early film. You know, people always think of this as a kind of a one-way street. Um, and I think intermediality likewise is sometimes thought of as a one-way street. So I just, I'm just looking for, you know, kind of correspondences and exchanges that sort of surprised you maybe. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, the, the, the copyright question, like it's also very interesting for me because the copyright notion is very different in, in, in Europe and in, in France, we say the droit d'auteur and this, frame things and arts uh, and media very differently because uh, it's all a question of are you copying things or are you like owning something and in this relationship between media arts and everything that we just demonstrated here and and uh, all with the, the the notion of intermediality we are uh, always like um studying this relationship and, and this, this way of reappropriation or something. And this panel was fantastic about that for uh, this study. So I think, <laughs> I think really like the, the conference theme um, is, is, is mainly like the absolute perfect notion to study intermediality. I'm, I'm happy to try and respond a, a little bit as well to Artemis's question. Um, if I'm on now, I can never tell, but anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And, um, you know, again, I want to go back to, you know, uh, um, a point that's been, you know, made for me again and again as I listen to people's presentation and the sources and the, the archives that they're working on, that, um, you know, the history of, um, copyright and intellectual property and patents is, is, I do believe, a particularly rich site for, for drawing apart historiographical problematics as well. Um, and to, to, you know, have us think about, you know, what are the, um, you know, what are the ways in which historiography has had certain biases throughout film history. Um, in the work that I'm doing with aviation and cinema, I've been very profoundly inspired by, um, and you can see this in some of the publications that I've already um, done, in a statement that the avant-garde artist Fanon Leger makes around 1930, where he says in this essay on cinema that cinema and aviation are born the same day, they, you know, emerge hand in hand and part of what he's doing there is is a provocation to history it's, it's very clear it's part of a, a contrastive spirit in in Leger's work where he's wanting to put things that hadn't been put together together um, and so indeed you know I think that um, 
you know, a lot of the, the talks that I've been hearing today are, are doing that, um, you know, um, are making that type of effort to, to go back to historiographical myths to a certain degree um, and to try to refine the shock of what it means to put something next to something else that typically um, hasn't been combined before. It's the spirit of surrealism and collage, etc. But it's also the spirit of invention as well. Um, again, I'll just very quickly mention that, you know, we all know that the, the Wright brothers and their contraption was profoundly inspiring to people like Braque and um, Picasso, because it was this assemblage, this strange assemblage, this bricolage assemblage. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Mm, wonderful. We have a question uh, from Ian Christie. Um, he says, perhaps for Valentin and others, uh, the illustrated press of the late 19th, early 20th century was an important bridge between art and film, like the graphic. Can we be more systematic about mapping its role? Uh, that's interesting because <laughs> in, this, in this new book, which is like, uh, I... <laughs> I proposed um, an article, uh, and so the the conference uh, was about uh, how to to rethink the attraction narration dialectics, and I proposed to to use a third terms uh, third term that, that is illustration, uh, because I think that illustration is uh, is a paradigm for early cinema, and. Um, for me, it it uh, it is like it's not only like the illustrations uh, reshaping in the in the in the in the films, but it's also that. But it's all the functioning of of selecting a small part and uh, choosing something like very uh, synthetic to illustrate one image for a big a big book or something. And to be in this uh, perspective of um, of yeah uh, doing something in one image or so for me like illustration is a key word uh, and a key uh, concept to really understand this relationship to, uh, of 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 cinema with images and with uh, other um, other media and and this uh, connection so. Um, so really, like I think this is a perfect question because it's uh, it, it's really revealing. And, and now, as I was saying, I am comparing cinema to paintings, but in fact, the um, the filmmakers uh, most of the time they don't they, they didn't see the original painting. They just used illustrations and postcards and and journal illustrations. So. Uh, it's all the same, like um, a big uh, illustration filter. And Ian writes, yes, illustration is absolutely key. Looking forward to seeing the book. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment, but we I was going to see if anybody had questions for each other. So yes, did you anticipate oh, that? I was going to. I was going to jump in on your first question, Artemis. I don't have a big, <laughs> a great okay. answer, but I think one of the things, I mean, there's different narrative, like there's not one narrative of sort of, but there are different kinds of dominant narratives, right? There's a technological narrative of pre-cinema and instantaneous photography, chronophotography being the basis for cinematic and, and they tend to be these units. So what was interesting to me and my project was very much a, a kind of side project that grew out of a little exhibition I did when I was at the University of St. Andrews. It's not part of a bigger, but what was interesting to me, and I'd love to know more about if I were going to pursue this, is to take something like Mui Bridges, um, his Animal Locomotion subscription series, which people could subscribe to and see how people actually used it. Because that, talk about like not following the narrative. And that was, I think the stuff I was talking about was a bit of an example of that. Like here's a kind of, a, somebody who wants to be a very serious scientist using this, not at all as photographs, but as kind of traceable, their photographic basis, but that as a kind of palimpsestic tracing to, to put something else in there, and then, which then becomes interesting to surrealist artists and new age groups and whatever. So that's my short answer. But the other thing I would mention, most of the papers, I was thinking the whole time about a nonlinear media history, a cyclical media history, and the way these things are coming back today. So Valentin's Tableau Vivant, you see this in social and shareable social media videos all the time, people imitating paintings. Now it's coming back in a kind of amateur mode in a context of um, participation and sharing, which I bet would, would bring about its own questions of copyright. 
Um, Ariel, I mean, <laughs> the nexus between um, the nexus between filmic vision and aerial vision has been with us all the time. But you do have a sort of you have the drones, and that has its own set of videos. And and so and in your stuff, there's there's a whole set of like practices around multimedia projection now in fashion shows. I'm not sure I don't have to tell you that. I'm just sort of interested in the resurgence of these various practices. I, I'll leave it there because I don't really know what to say about it. But uh -huh. does anyone else want to make any comments or to or questions have questions for each other? Yeah, just an answer to the, sh uh, the first question you raised. I think for me, what interests me more uh, most is uh, this interaction between the patent and the copyright, which because I think like copyright scholars mainly dealing with like this, uh, um, copyright scholar dealing with the copyright and patent scholar dealing with the patent. But since the 21st century, like from the legal literature that I have read, I think like more and more like legal scholars started to like recognize the, the interrelationship between the two legal bodies. And I'm thinking about like, because we often like to draw this like the, the parallel between two turns of the century. And I'm thinking about like how we can apply this like relatively new perspective back to early cinema to study the multimedia environment. And also for the to follow uh, presentation, I think the connection between the, the early cinema and aviation is really fascinating. And it also forced me to think about more about the connection that was established, but suppressed like in the media history, but they made their return like in a new media the context, like there's Microsoft like flight simulator where you can go to the Disneyland, there's a very popular attraction called like soaring like all around the world, which is basically a 4D cinema, this kind of thing. So yeah, I think it's a really fascinating panel and really forces me to think a, lo a lot more about some of the issues that we were confronted with, yeah. Yes, thank you organizers for putting us all together. And um, I'm, I'm sure you probably already know uh, Patrick Ellis's work on the aerial view, but um, might be of interest to you, Frank. Um, and I, I think that we should probably in this service of time, if there aren't any other questions, um, maybe perhaps, uh, perhaps sort of wrap things up here. Um, uh, Martin, do you have anything to add? I was thinking, um, it's kind of wonderful that these are being, uh, recorded and will be yes. uploaded. We'll be able to kind of revisit them again and again, because I would kind of, uh, you know, I was paying attention to so many different things that I'd love to revisit them myself. So, um. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, great, terrific. Um, so I think with that, we can close for today and we will see you tomorrow at again, 10 a.m. Eastern time and looking forward to another rich day of papers. So see you tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.